Welcome to Music History Monday for November 27th, 2023. I'm Bob Greenberg, and the title for today's podcast is Richard Strauss, Stanley Kubrick, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Thus Spoke Zarathustra. On November 27th, 1896, 127 years ago today, Richard Strauss conducted the premier performance of his sprawling orchestral tone poem, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, in the German city of Frankfurt. Requests A momentary and applicable, if gratuitous, diversion. Over the course of the first half of my musical life, I played a lot of gigs, both in bands and as a solo piano player. The bands ranged from fairly high-end to not fairly high-end. The best band I ever played with was led by the alto saxophonist Lee Konitz. The worst was a disco band, the name of which will remain my little secret. The first band in which I played was a rock and roll garage band called Cold Sun and the last was a Berkeley, California-based klezmer group called Hot Borscht. Cold Sun and Hot Borscht, temperature-challenged tags in both cases. As a solo player, I've played pretty much every sort of gig, from cocktail parties, weddings, sing-alongs, award shows, and receptions, to a long-running gig at a long-defunct restaurant in Oakland, California, called The Pewter House. I played at The Pewter House in 1978 and 1979 on Friday and Saturday evenings. It was most definitely during my starving grad student stage, so what I particularly loved about the job was the dinner I'd eat with the staff after closing time. There was always leftover prime rib, and I consumed my body weight on a weekly basis. I also loved the people I worked with and dined with after hours. The bartender, a big, beautifully mustachioed Czech guy named Marin. The waitstaff, particularly the cocktail waitresses. OMG, how I continue to adore cocktail waitresses. And the kitchen staff mostly illegals, who worked like dogs at multiple jobs and sent whatever money they could back home. Talk about a cross-section of Oakland's population. What I did not love about my job was an occupational hazard shared by all house musicians, and that is the request. I'd prime my tip jar with a 20 and a couple of fives, but that wouldn't stop folks from making requests and then winking at me as they dropped a dime or a quarter into the jar, as if they were doing me a favor. As evenings wore on and the restaurant's action increasingly moved into the cocktail lounge where the piano was located, the blood alcohol level of the clientele became markedly higher. It was not at all uncommon later in the evening for me to be approached by an off-kilter patron who, in making their request, would say something on the lines of, Hey, man, can you guys play? Yes, I was a solo act, but perhaps these inebriates were seeing double, thus the you guys. Among the most common requests I received at the Pewter House there in the late 1970s were, Can you guys play The Sting? This meant Scott Joplin's classic rag, The Entertainer, which dominated the soundtrack of the 1973 Paul Newman, Robert Redford movie, The Sting. Just as often I was asked to play Love is Blue, Classical Gas, Brian's song and, and, wait for it, the theme from 2001. 2001, a space odyssey, produced, directed, and co-written by Stanley Kubrick, 1928 to 1999. 
By the theme from 2001, my requesters were referring to the opening minute and a half of Richard Strauss's orchestral tone poem, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. In Strauss's work, this opening music is meant to represent sunrise and with it, the coming of the light, meaning the coming of enlightenment. In his movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey of 1968, Kubrick uses Strauss's music to represent exactly the same thing. Strauss's Thus Spoke Zarathustra is the sonic equivalent of the monolith, together the bringers of knowledge, enlightenment, and transformation. In the video linked, we will see the opening credit of 2001 A Space Odyssey, sunrise and with it the coming of the light, a visual accompanied by the opening of Richard Strauss's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. What follows is a sequence called The Dawn of Man, during which the monolith makes its appearance before our human ancestors. For our information, the music that accompanies the monolith's sudden appearance is Georgi Ligeti's Requiem of 1965. Soon enough, the monolith's impact on the course of evolution becomes apparent. It has taught an ancestral human to use tools, specifically a tool he will use to kill. That moment of revelation is accompanied again by the opening of Thus Spoke Zarathustra. The opening of the Dawn of Man sequence is linked. For me, the scene is as breathtaking today as it was when I first saw it at the age of 14 in 1968. Stanley Kubrick's use of the opening of Thus Spoke Zarathustra across the span of 2001 is nothing less than brilliant. Unfortunately, that opening is about all most people know of this sprawling 35-minute long work, its first 90 seconds. It is a magnificent piece of music, though not a particularly easy one to get to know. Over the course of the remainder of this post and tomorrow's Dr. Bob prescribes, we will indeed get to know it. Thus spoke Zarathustra, a symphony about a symphony. Strauss's Thus Spoke Zarathustra is indeed a symphony about a symphony, a multi-movement orchestral work about Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophical-slash-poetic masterwork of the same title, which he completed in 1885. Nietzsche, 1844-1900, himself wrote, quote, Where does my Zarathustra really belong? Almost, I think, among the symphonies." Unquote. Nietzsche, who had been trained as a composer and who numbered among his professions that of music critic, knew precisely what he was saying when he called his Zarathustra a symphony. It is in no way a traditional philosophical track, but rather a super intense virtuosic prose poem a symphony of impassioned words and ideas, one that features very much the same sort of convoluted, overheated, semi-philosophical writing produced by Nietzsche's hero-turned-nemesis, the composer and self-styled artistic philosopher Richard Wagner, 1813-1883. Friedrich Nietzsche. He was born near Leipzig in the German kingdom of Saxony. At the age of 18, he enrolled at the University of Bonn to study philology and theology. After just one semester, he dropped his theological studies, informing his outraged mother that he had, quote, lost his faith, unquote. Increasingly, Nietzsche was attracted to philosophical ideas that rejected tradition and authority in favor of rebellion, and individuality. 
The man was a total brainiac. At the age of 24, he was appointed professor of classical philology at the University of Basel, despite the fact that he had not yet completed his PhD or even received his teaching credential. According to Paul Bishop, writing in his book, Nietzsche and Antiquity, Nietzsche was among the youngest tenured classics professors ever. Unfortunately, Nietzsche does not hold the record for being among the longest tenured classics professors. Plagued by chronic ill health, migraine headaches, moments of short-sightedness that reportedly left him nearly blind, and what the literature calls violent indigestion. Be still our colons. Nietzsche resigned his tenure at the age of 35 in order to concentrate on writing. These writings, which include Thus Spoke Zarathustra, are preoccupied, even obsessed, with the origin and function of values in human life. Nietzsche railed against Christianity and famously announced the death of God, who in the end had the last laugh by announcing the death of Nietzsche. Nietzsche's analyses of the basic motives and values that lie beneath Western religion, philosophy, and morality have influenced and inspired generations of students, philosophers, hippies, psychologists, theologians, and writers, to say nothing of graffiti artists. Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra, up close and personal. Zarathustra, also known as Zoroaster, was an ancient Persian prophet who is believed to have been born in 628 BCE in what presently is suburban Tehran. It is impossible today to distinguish the teachings of the historical Zarathustra from those of the many Zoroastrian sects that sprang up after his death. As best as we can tell, Zarathustra did preach monotheism in what was an overwhelmingly polytheistic environment and went on the record as opposing human sacrifice, which was, we think, a very good thing to go on the record against. In his philosophical poem, Also Spoke Zarathustra, Nietzsche uses the historical Zarathustra like a ventriloquist dummy to spout out his own ideas about the purpose of human life and the fate of humankind. Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra consists of 80 fairly brief chapters or discourses or sermons in which his fictionalized Zarathustra holds forth on a wide variety of subjects from virtue, criminality, and war to women, priests, and chastity. These discourses are framed by a literary device that sees Zarathustra retreat from humanity to the solitude of a hermit's cave, emerging periodically to walk among the people in order to share what he has learned during his isolation. Of all the philosophical ideas that emerge over the course of Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra, the most controversial is the notion of the Ubermensch, the Superman. Nietzsche, speaking as Zarathustra, writes, quote, I teach you the Superman. Man is a thing to be surmounted. What is the ape to man? A jest or a thing of shame. So shall it be to the Superman. Man is a rope stretched betwixt the beast and Superman, a rope over an abyss. Man is a bridge, not a goal. The Superman is the goal of the earth." Unquote. According to the British musicologist John Williamson, quote, for Nietzsche, the Superman was equated with the acceptance of not merely life, but of death as the necessary condition of life, the tragic background that made life itself, and not the values of religion and the herd, a cause for celebration.
unquote. It is this Superman, this perfect incarnation of humankind, to which Nietzsche's Zarathustra aspires. He proceeds to cast off gods, religions, and customs created, so he believes, by ignorance and fear. In the process, Zarathustra suffers a breakdown and emerges reborn, transfigured, with a tendency to shout, O oh, Mensch, gebacht! O oh, men, take heed! with a disconcerting frequency. Richard Strauss 1864 to 1949. Richard Strauss lived a long time, 85 years, and composed a lot of extraordinary music from near the beginning of his life to its end. His first masterwork is an orchestral work entitled Don Juan, composed in 1888 when he was 24 years old. His last masterwork is the appropriately entitled Four Last Songs for soprano and orchestra, completed in 1948, when Strauss was 84 years old. Strauss's music straddles the artistic fence between the late stage of German Romanticism and the experimental modernism of the early 20th century. He was born in Munich on June 11, 1864. His father, Franz Strauss, 1822 to 1905, was the most famous French horn player in Germany and a holy terror. Franz Strauss was famously outspoken about his hatred of radical Romanticism. More than any other music, Franz Strauss claimed to abhor that of Richard Wagner, whom he called a subversive. Franz Strauss's attitude towards Wagner would have amounted to little more than the spiteful rantings of a musical crank were he not the principal horn player of the Munich Court Orchestra and therefore the principal horn player in the premieres of Wagner's Tristan and Isolde, the Master Singers of Nuremberg, the Rheingold, and the Valkyrie. Franz Strauss argued with Wagner constantly and told Wagner to his face that he had no idea how to compose for the horn. But for all his insufferable behavior, Franz Strauss was tolerated. Wagner himself explained why. Quote, Strauss is an unbearable, curmudgeonly fellow, but when he plays his horn one can say nothing, for it is so beautiful." Unquote. Franz Strauss oversaw his son Richard's musical education, a rigorous program based on classical era musical models. Richard was forbidden to study, listen to, or perform music composed by radical romantics, music by Hector Berlioz, Franz Liszt, and that awful Herr Wagner. Well, we all know about how well such parental prescriptions work. One can no longer keep a talented teenage boy away from rock and roll than you can keep him away from oxygen, protein, testosterone, and girls. If anything, Franz Strauss's attitude accelerated his son's fascination with radical romanticism. At the age of 17, in open defiance of his father, Richard Strauss fell for the music of Richard Wagner. Many years later, Richard Strauss wrote in his memoirs, quote, It was not until, against my father's orders, I studied the score of Wagner's Tristan and Isolde, that I entered into this magical work. I can well remember how, at the age of 17, I positively wolfed down the score of Tristan as if in a trance." Unquote. Wagner's music, with its harmonic and expressive audacity, contrapuntal complexity, and its reliance on light motifs to create complex extra-musical references and meaning, became the single decisive influence on Richard Strauss's compositional maturity. 
It was their shared fascination for Richard Wagner's work that spiritually united Friedrich Nietzsche and Richard Strauss. Richard Strauss's thus spoke Zarathustra. From the 80 chapter headings, sermon titles if you will, in Nietzsche's original, Strauss selected eight that inspired his artistic cockles. Beginning with the prologue, Strauss arranged the order of those eight sermon titles to serve his artistic ends, which he identified as being, quote, to convey in music an idea of evolution of the human race from its origin through the various phases of development to the Ubermensch, unquote. If this sounds as well like the overarching theme of Stanley Kubrick's film, 2001, A Space Odyssey, well, that's no coincidence. It is this ongoing evolution achieved musically through thematic development that holds the eight movements of Strauss's Thus Spoke Zarathustra together. When we return in tomorrow's Dr. Bob Prescribes post, it will be with a detailed musical example accompanied examination of Richard Strauss's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Until then, thank you.